Members, I have received notice from the First Minister and Deputy First Minister that they wish to make a statement. And first of all, could I welcome very much the fact that we have the First Minister here this morning to address the Assembly. And it follows on from yesterday when we had two Ministers in to uh, brief the Assembly. Uh, these are very important uh, contributions to the Assembly, and I want to uh, extend appreciation to the members of the Executive for doing so. Before I call the Minister, I would remind members that in light of social distancing, uh, the, being observed by parties, the Speaker's rulings that members must be in the chamber to hear a statement if they wish to ask a, sta a question has been relaxed. Members do still have to make sure that their name is on the speaking list if they wish to be called, but they can do this by rising in their place as well as notifying the business office or Speaker's table directly. I remain members to be concise in asking their question. This is not an opportunity for debate per se, and long introductions should not be uh, the thing. So I call the Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And in compliance with Section 52C2 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998, I wish to make the following statement on recent developments taken by the Executive in the impact and try and impact the spread of the coronavirus epidemic. These decisions have been taken against the following backdrop. Since the beginning of July, there has been a gradual but sustained rise in the number of positive COVID-19 tests. On Saturday, the Department of Health confirmed a further 319 people in Northern Ireland had tested positive for coronavirus. Since then, a further 407 people have tested positive. Saturday was the highest daily tally reported since the pandemic began and brings the total number of confirmed cases reported to 10,949. 1,513 cases were diagnosed in this last seven days alone. Unfortunately, one death has been reported, bringing the death toll to 578. There are currently 51 COVID patients in hospitals across Northern Ireland, with six in intensive care, and there are outbreaks of the virus in 28 care homes. Evidence we have from the Test, Trace, Protect programme tells us that a significant number of the COVID cases are being acquired through household contacts and informal interactions in the community. Wherever people meet each other, there is a risk of transmission. This is why the Executive agreed that restrictions in domestic settings should be introduced in order to reduce community transmission occurring through indoor social gatherings and households. Initially, this was applied on a postcode basis, but now applies to all areas of Northern Ireland. These restrictions are a necessary and proportionate approach to address the increasing number of COVID cases that we have witnessed since early July and which have accelerated over the past weeks. Positive case numbers are of serious concern to the Executive, the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Advisor. The numbers themselves and the rate at which cases are doubling should be a concern to all parts of our society, including the business sector and citizens. If allowed to continue, this will inevitably lead to an increase in hospital admissions and deaths, and that is something we must try to minimise. Building on the measures already in place, the Executive agreed last Thursday that a closing time of 11 p.m. should be applied to the hospitality sector. This will come into effect from midnight on Wednesday, 30 September 2020, and apply to those parts of the hospitality sector subject to current regulations, including pubs, bars, restaurants and cafes, as well as hotel and guest house bars. No alcohol or food will be served after 10.30, and all customers must leave by 11 p.m. In practice, this brings the normal closing times forward by half an hour, and there will be no late licences. The intention behind the earlier closing time is that socialising later in the evening is considered to increase the risk of virus spreading because people adhere to the rules less strictly after consuming alcohol and in venues where they are used to mixing freely. There can be no exceptions to this, so weddings and other important social events will also be required to comply. From last Thursday, the 24th of September, all businesses that serve food or drink in England, Scotland and Wales have been required to shut at 10 o'clock every night under new measures that were introduced to control the rising rate of coronavirus. That includes pubs, restaurants, cafes, social clubs, casinos and bingo halls. The 10 p.m. closing that had initially been imposed in certain areas in England then became a nationwide restriction. 
That is because of the need to ask people to further limit their social interactions. Sales of alcohol from off licences in supermarkets in Northern Ireland already stop at 11 o'clock. This will help ensure a consistent approach in border areas. Some will make the point that pubs and bars closing at 11 p.m. will drive people to house parties, and we recognise that risk. However, house parties and gatherings in our homes are illegal. The restrictions already in place ban people from more than one household to be in a, dwell a private dwelling, or more than six people from no more than two households to be in a private garden. The totality of the arrangements will be subject to enforcement. We do not want to go there, Mr Speaker. We would prefer that everyone works with us to impact the spread of the virus. But enforcement has a role, and we are working closely with the Police Service of Northern Ireland and local government to understand the issues from their perspectives and also the importance of community responses. Junior ministers are working closely with the police and local government, and we will be looking at the fines levels we have here as a matter of priority. It is essential that business owners and members of the public adhere to these restrictions, which will help reduce the length of time the restrictions will need to be retained. We want to avoid more stringent measures, but we have been clear from the outset of this pandemic that we will put restrictions in place if we have to. We will do so carefully and with great thought to the social and economic impacts, but if we need to act, we will. As always, we must continue to be extremely careful in all aspects of our lives, particularly for the medically vulnerable members of our community. And we appreciate that this is a time for everyone, a difficult time for everyone, and yet more restrictions are not what any of us want. And I think that's very important to say that, Mr. Speaker. We cannot emphasize enough that the regulations are intended to protect you, to protect other people, to reduce the spread of infection, and to bring the epidemic to an end as soon as possible. We assure this House that the restrictions will be kept under constant review and measures will be removed if possible, but equally they may be added to if necessary. We can all help curb the spread of the virus by maintaining social distancing, maintaining good hand and respiratory hygiene, wearing face coverings, self-isolating immediately if we experience any symptoms, including a new persistent cough, a fever or a loss or change of smell or taste, seeking a test if we experience any of these symptoms, downloading the Stop COVID NI app and complying with the restrictions in place. Our message is simple. If each and every one of us does our bit, we will help bring the epidemic to an end sooner rather than later, and by doing that, save lives. Thank you, Minister, and I call Colin McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I welcome today's statement from the Executive Office and the First Minister and the confirmation that it provides. Further to this, I welcome the ability for us to be as representatives here and ask questions and to seek clarity on the decisions that have been taken. And it's fairly obvious that we are facing a crisis in this pandemic. Nearly 15 to 20 per cent of the cases have been recorded in the past week alone. And the Minister, First Minister has detailed the new rules and regulations that are welcome in terms of assistance to try and curb that. But could the Minister outline any discussions or considerations that there have been to giving help to businesses in the hospitality industry that are close to the edge as it is, and these restrictions may push them over? Because I have to wonder, where is our economy minister to deliver us a plan, not a reaction to what has happened, but a concrete plan to help businesses and to support those that are going to lose their livelihoods and everything that goes with it because of the restrictions? I thank the uh, Chair for his uh, question. And indeed, we have been engaging quite closely with the hospitality sector, as he would expect us to do as an executive. We have taken a partnership approach with that sector right throughout, given the fact um, that it was um, told to close very early in the uh, pandemic, and then has been one of the last, uh, if you like, to reopen again. And we recognise all the pressures and strains that that brings on those businesses. It was because of our uh, consciousness, if you like, of the pressures uh, that the hospitality sector is under, and also observing the 10 o'clock curfew uh, in other parts of the United Kingdom and the way in which that has worked, uh, that we decided to have an 11 o'clock curfew. And we hope that that will allow businesses, particularly restaurants and hotels, to have a second sitting 
um, because that was one of the concerns that was raised with us uh, around the 10 o'clock curfew. It wouldn't allow two sittings in a restaurant. We hope that that now can happen. And uh, so we have been listening very carefully to the hospitality sector. Uh, in terms of uh, the recovery piece, um, this is something that the executive as a whole have been working on. We have uh, agreed a tentative recovery framework and we have been working with the Department of Finance and the Chair will know that uh, just last week the Minister for Finance came forward with more allocations uh, in respect of trying to fight COVID. Uh, and there is still some money left in that uh, budget uh, to deal with some of the known unknowns uh, that are yet to come before us. Uh, because we know that things are going to get difficult for a lot of businesses uh, and therefore we need to be prepared to try and work with those sectors uh, when those difficulties come. I regret that we have to make this uh, announcement today. I think we all do. But what we're trying to do is to take an appropriate, proportionate reaction to what you've already pointed out, and that's the rising number of cases right across Northern Ireland. Um, when you put it in that very stark way, over 1,500 cases diagnosed in this past week, I think that's quite a significant rise, uh, Mr Speaker, so it's important that we do act in a proportionate way, that we do listen to the voice of businesses, but that we also put lives um, to the forefront of our mind, uh, and as well as saving lives, that we think on livelihoods as well. So I take very much what the Chair is saying, uh, and we will continue to work with him and his colleagues in the committee as we step through what will be a very difficult time. I call Trevor Clark. Chair, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for coming to the House today with this statement? Can I ask the Minister, in relation to him, and we've heard much about people who comply and some who don't comply, but I think very much what's in people's minds about actually who will enforce the regulations? Well, of course, right from the beginning of this pandemic, we have said to the people of Northern Ireland that we want to work in partnership with them. We want to work in partnership with the various sectors, the hospitality sector, citizens generally. Um, sports, for example, and we're working uh, very hard uh, with those organisations. And we've listened today to the threats to some of the Irish League teams and the fact that they have no income coming in. I noticed as well yesterday uh, the GAA were making a very similar point uh, in relation to their funding. So we have been working very much in partnership with people. But as I said in my statement, enforcement does have a role to play. And the junior ministers are leading uh, the enforcement group from the executive. They are working with the Police Service of Northern Ireland and with local government uh, to make sure that we have the appropriate, first of all, powers in place. Do we need to revisit uh, the level of fines that we have in place? I mean, it would, I would much prefer uh, that people would work with us and comply with the restrictions and listen to the guidance because, you know, it's for their own good. It is for individuals' own goods and therefore it's important to take uh, some responsibility for our own actions. But yes, you're right, enforcement does play a role in all of this. And for those people who persistently offend, uh, we will have to deal with that through the appropriate uh, authority, whether that's local government, whether it's the Health and Safety Executive, or whether it's the Police Service of Northern Ireland. Thank you. And I call Pat Sheehan. I thank the First Minister for this statement this morning. And I wonder if I could ask the First Minister, does she believe that the British Government uh, job support scheme is adequate to support workers who have to leave work to self-isolate? Well, I think there's two things there. First of all, the, those people who have to self-isolate, um, the Government has announced uh, a package of £500 um, so that people can remain at home. We have still uh, to get more clarity in relation to that, whether it's a Barnet consequential or whether it's demand-led, to make sure that those people here in Northern Ireland can avail of that. But in terms of the job support scheme, obviously we knew the furlough scheme was coming to an end. Uh, the executive as a whole was concerned about the fact that that was going to lead to a cliff edge in relation uh, to those people who were on the furlough scheme. Uh, the job support scheme is not as generous as the furlough scheme, and I think everyone has accepted that. Uh, but at least it allows us to move uh, forward without a complete cliff edge. I am concerned for those industries, uh, and I have met representatives from these industries very recently, the events industry, 
outgoing, outgoing travel industry uh, representatives. Those companies basically have no work at this present moment in time, and so under the job support scheme, don't really have viable jobs for people to go to. So I am concerned about some of those industries, uh, and we will need to look to see what we can do to help. But the job support scheme is not uh, as good as the furlough scheme, but it is better, certainly, than having nothing at all to support industries here in Northern Ireland, Mr Speaker. I'm going to call John Stewart. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank the First Minister for her statement on this. Um, as you rightly said, the um, United Kingdom has a 10 o'clock curfew, the Republic of Ireland have a half 11, and we've arrived at the half 10 and out for 11. Can you give some clarity, First Minister, as to how that time has come about? You can understand that the public and that the sector will, will be looking at this thinking that these times are just being almost plucked out of the air. Why is there that variety across the, these islands, and why did the executive decide on 10.30 or 4.11? Well, it's certainly not, and thank the member for his question, it's certainly not plucked from the air. We have looked at the experience uh, in England, Wales and Scotland. Um, you will have noticed, I'm sure, some of the television coverage over the weekend about people leaving uh, bars at 10 o'clock uh, and the crowds in the streets and what have you. Uh, we want to make sure that we aligned with off-licences and supermarkets who stop selling alcohol at 11 o'clock. So the allegation that people will leave the pub and go to a, a house party they cannot go to a supermarket or off licence to, to buy alcohol because uh, the sale of alcohol stops at 11 o'clock. So we felt that that was a good reason um, to close at 11 o'clock. And we were conscious of the fact that the Republic of Ireland curfew is at half past 11, uh, but we assess that people will not travel across the border for such a short period of time. So that's why we chose the 11 o'clock curfew. I think it has been a reasoned discussion amongst colleagues, Mr Speaker, and certainly has the support of the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Advisor when we take in the holistic approach as behaviour patterns as to what will happen when people leave uh, public houses, hotels and restaurants and what have you. So that is why we arrived at the decision of 11 o'clock. Thank you. I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for coming to the House. It's a useful opportunity to get an update on the situation and to seek clarity. Uh, on the 17th of September, the Executive Office issued a statement saying that beer bikes will not be permitted to operate, but thus far there has been no legislation or no action to make that a reality. Can the First Minister outline what actions are being taken to make that a reality? I do thank the Member for his question. Beer bikes are a, a particular problem. Uh, we are currently considering how to deal with that particular problem, and officials uh, will be engaging with the operators uh, of uh, those bikes. But he is right to point out that that is uh, still something that needs to be dealt with, and I hope that we can deal with it sooner rather than later, because it is an anomaly at present, and it needs to be dealt with. I call George Robinson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could I thank the Minister for her statement? And uh, could I ask the Minister why did the executive not match the 10 p.m. closure the same as in England? And how are ministers trying to get the message through to young people and students? Yes, well, thank the member for his question. I think uh, I have responded to the why we decided on the 11 o'clock um, uh, time, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's because we took into uh, consideration all of the, the different uh, issues. Um, around ensuring that uh, hospitality was able to have a second sitting if they were having food, uh, making sure that we close at the same times as off licences uh, and uh, supermarkets in terms of the sale of alcohol, um, taking into account that there was a small differential between ourselves and the Republic of Ireland, which means that people uh, should not uh, travel across the border just for that small time differential, and of course taking into consideration the experience of the 10 o'clock curfew uh, on the mainland. Uh, the member is right to point out the need for us to have good messaging uh, to young people. It is something I addressed here yesterday during question time. I, I do believe that we need uh, to reach those young people in an effective way. Uh, and so the Executive Information Service is currently engaging on new digital messaging uh, and also using uh, radio stations such as Cool FM that um, the uh, uh, younger generation would listen to, although I am partial to a bit of Cool FM myself, Mr Speaker. Um, but uh, it is important that we use the appropriate platforms to reach um, our, our younger people, and we are certainly looking at that at present. I call Martina Anderson. Uh, 
Uh, Minister, as we all know, Ireland is a single epidemiological unit, particularly for animal health, but I want to talk about human health and ask you that the PHA has said that there is a cross-border protocol in place for tracking. However, as you know, Derry and Straban and Donegal, the rate there is alarming, and yet doctors are saying they don't know about it and they're, on a, they're not using it. So is the executive planning to increase, particularly for cross-border workers who cross the border every day, and are they going to increase the tracking and tracing for those workers? Yes, I thank the member for her question. And I, I heard the GP from, I think it was Lifford, make that very point uh, about the tracking and tracing. I, I was a little surprised about that because uh, I had understood that our Stop COVID NI app was operable, interoperable with the app on the Republic of Ireland. So it's something that we will certainly look at. I know um, that the Chief Medical Officer here and his counterpart in Dublin have been working very closely on these issues. Um, uh, myself and the Deputy First Minister took calls from Taoiseach last Thursday when he was alerting uh, us to the issue in Donegal. And immediately we spoke to the Chief Medical Officer to make sure that there was that uh, ongoing contact. Uh, because we do, of course, realise that a lot of people work in either jurisdiction, uh, and therefore it is important that they are able to continue that work, but at the same time that we're able to track where the virus is and to try to break the transmission of the virus, because that's the most important thing. I call Palm Cameron. And I thank the First Minister for her statement to the House this morning. It's, a, it's very concerning that we have over 1,500 uh, new cases in the past week, so I welcome the clarification on closing times for establishments which serve alcohol and to include weddings as well. Uh, First Minister, in terms of the uh, enforcement group that has been set up to, do, to look at enforcement, would it not be more appropriate to have the Minister of Justice take part in that particular group? Well, I thank the member for her question. I mean, obviously, it's inappropriate for me to answer on behalf of the Justice Minister. Um, I think that she took the view that, uh, in relation to the chairing of the group, um, the enforcement issues were wider than her own uh, ministerial portfolio, so um, she didn't feel it was appropriate to chair the Justice Group. But, look, it's important that we have this group in place. Um, we cannot uh, allow uh, things to to be held back. So the junior ministers um, are uh, chairing that enforcement group. I think it's highly important that that work continues. Um, as the member knows, I said yesterday, the, office, the executive office is meeting with the universities today, uh, and the enforcement group will continue to meet with local government, uh, with our colleagues in the Police Service of Northern Ireland, and indeed all of the other agencies that have a role uh, in relation to enforcement. So part of it is enforcement. But again, I stress uh, it's important that everybody has responsibility for their own actions, and compliance is very important as we run through what will be a very difficult time for us all over the next couple of weeks and months. Nicole Liz Kimmins. I'm all good. Can call and thank the Minister for her statement this morning. Um, the issue of closing time for the hospitality industry is a clear example of the need for us to work on an all Ireland basis. Um, in our response to COVID-19, particularly for people living in border areas. Can the Minister outline what engagement um, the Executive has had on this basis? Well, I think we were very conscious uh, of the fact of the curfew uh, at half past 11 uh, in the Republic of Ireland and um, uh, conscious of what was happening in the UK uh, mainland as well. Um, but we have always said we will take the decisions that are appropriate uh, to Northern Ireland. Uh, I believe that is what we have done in this regard as well, uh, because we have recognised that it might be a slightly later time in the Republic of Ireland, but frankly the travel time is so uh, small uh, that we do not think the incentive is there to go across the border uh, to continue uh, to, to seek alcohol. So, uh, I think we have taken into consideration the different jurisdictions, the different experiences, whilst listening as well. Uh, to our hospitality industry. And look, I know that some in the hospitality industry, we've already heard from some of them this morning, will be disappointed uh, by this announcement today. But we're doing this to keep them open generally uh, and to allow people to continue uh, in, a, in a more limited way. I accept that. But if we take action now, we're hoping that we can stop the spread, stop the transmission, 
and then hopefully deal with these issues uh, in a progressive way so that we can return to normality quicker. Because if we don't intervene now, things will get worse, uh, and therefore we will have to take more punitive measures. And none of us, none of us want to do that. What we want to do is to stop the transmission of the virus, and that is the focus. I call Pat Kettner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you, First Minister, for coming today and briefing us on the figures that are there. First Minister, responsible publicans are prepared to follow these regulations uh, to the letter in order for to keep people safe. Uh, this industry is one of our most highly regulated in our society, and they know how best they can look after people within their own premises. I think we've missed a trick here on this. Simply, can I ask you, given that last orders will be at 10.30, off sales will be opened until 11, 11 p.m., does she have any concerns that people leaving the bar at 10.30 will be able to go to an off sales, tank up with alcohol and head off to house parties? This is a major concern and I think it's a flaw within the regulations. The off sales probably should have been closed before the bar at 10.30. Well, I, um, look, I, I recognise um, the member's expertise in this area, um, but we believe that if last orders are at 10.30, then you have drinking up time to 11 o'clock. The off-licence is closed at 11 o'clock. Uh, look, we cannot, if people decide to leave the bars at 10 o'clock and go to the off-licences, there's very little we can do about that. What we're trying to do is to have uniformity across the piece, uh, and by having off licenses, supermarkets, all of the other hospitality industry close at the same time. We think that does give a uniformity uh, and it does provide that clarity because we've heard uh, from people when there are different times that they are confused. Uh, we took some time over this. We took some criticism, uh, Mr Speaker, for not announcing this on Thursday of last week, but we were determined to get the regulations right uh, and to make sure that we had that clarity. And that is why I wanted to come to the House today to try and explain the thinking behind these regulations uh, and to say to you that I do believe that this is the best way forward, it's a reasoned way forward, and that is what we've put before the House today. I call Doug Beattie. Thank you, Mr uh, Speaker. Uh, Minister, it's not easy. Um, these are difficult decisions, uh, and I commend uh, all those who are making these uh, difficult decisions and showing that moral courage, and I urge people to lean in. Um, to those decisions. Uh, I agree enforcement isn't always the answer, but it is an important um, tool, and I'm disheartened to see that only one department uh, minister, uh, the Minister for Health, actually attends that working group. Obviously, it's, it's chaired by, by the junior uh, ministers. Um, and I want to follow up on, on, on a question by, by Pam Cameron. Can I ask the minister, was the Minister for Justice invited by the ministers or in writing to chair this strategic working group on enforcement? Well, the Minister of Justice, as I said, I can't answer for the Minister for Justice, and I'm sure you will raise this with the Minister directly. Um, I think my understanding is that, uh, is that she felt that um, she didn't want to chair uh, the meeting because she felt that the remit of the uh, enforcement group was wider uh, than her departmental responsibilities. I think that is patently the case, um, but I uh, would say to all ministers in the executive uh, that that enforcement group is open to anyone who wishes uh, to come along. Uh, I do pay tribute to the junior ministers for the work that they have been doing, along with the health minister on that uh, committee. It's not an easy subject. Uh, we certainly don't want to be in a position uh, to have to enforce any of this. We would much prefer if people complied and worked with us. But unfortunately, we have to have enforcement. Uh, and originally, we were looking at some of the issues around the Holy Lands, uh, but now that uh, group is wider. Uh, and as I say, uh, any minister of the executive can attend uh, that meeting, and we will ensure from our uh, office uh, that the notice sent out uh, to any minister that wants to attend, so that they can attend if desired. I'm going to call Keith Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, First Minister, uh, for answers so far. Uh, First Minister, there's a narrative and a following out there with regard to this crisis doesn't exist. It's a bad flu, and it's all a government hoax. What would you say to those individuals or those groups of people? Well, if they don't want to believe me, they can look at the data. <laughs> and I think, uh, as the Chair of the Committee has rightly pointed out today, the data 
uh, is very clear. We have 1,530 new cases within this last seven days. Now, when you look at, at the height of the pandemic, we didn't have that sort of uh, amount of cases. So it's not a hoax. It is a reality. And I think if you speak to anyone who has been unfortunate enough to uh, contract COVID-19, they will tell you very clearly that it is not a hoax, um, that it is something that impacts on them, not just during the time that they're feeling unwell, but stays with them for a considerable length of time as well, has an impact on all of your organs, and is a very painful experience to go through, a very scary experience to go through as well, sometimes, sadly, leading to death. So I say to people, OK, if you don't individually feel that you are, are at risk, think of your family, think of your friends, think of those who are vulnerable around you. Please don't be selfish. Please do the right thing and abide by the guidance that is there and the regulations that are there as well. Thank you. And I call Colm Gildernew. I can call you Agus Gormayagat, Prevaira Maran Fragrashin. Thank you for those answers and for coming to the Assembly today. And in relation to that point that, that Keith Buchanan has just raised, just to note that today, as a civilisation, we have crossed the horrendous threshold of one million deaths around the world from COVID-19. So it's clearly not a uh, false. Also to acknowledge that, by and large, the majority of people are abiding by the restrictions, which are onerous in themselves at times, but we, we should recognise that. However, it is clear that the test and trace system, which is a key component of fighting this, this virus, has been under pressure in recent times and may well come under additional pressure as we move into the winter months. Are there any plans to develop and build an additional and, and bespoke a additional capacity in the system here to deal with the pressures that we are now facing? Well, I thank the member for his uh, question, and he's right. Um, and I looked at some of the headlines in, in the newspapers this morning. It is a sobering thought to think of the fact that one million people have lost their lives to uh, this pandemic across the world. Um, in terms of the test and trace um, system, uh, we have been very pleased with the way in which that system has been working, particularly in our care homes. Uh, we've been able to identify um, the fact that there has been COVID-19 in some of our care homes solely down to our testing regime. Uh, and I think that uh, I think 24 out of the 27 confirmed uh, COVID care homes uh, were identified by the testing programme. So that is progress. Obviously, we wish that it wasn't in any of our care homes. Um, but if the uh, health minister does, rec does come to the executive and says that he needs further resources in relation uh, to his testing programme, I think he will have uh, a very empathetic ear from the executive and we will want to make sure that he has the resources available to him um, and if he does that we will certainly listen to what he has to say. Call Stuart Dixon. Thank you First Minister for your, your um, coming to the House and making a statement today. Can I welcome the statement but also in invite you to tell us what holistic approach you are actually taking to dealing with the totality of the pandemic here in Northern Ireland. After all our economy has been trashed. Public expenditure is out of control. Businesses are being destroyed. Thousands of patients have been denied life-saving treatment. Disabled people are unsupported, and our children's future has been mortgaged and damaged to the health. People's mental health and welfare is at risk. Dealing with one sector today is important, but what is your holistic approach? I want to thank the member for what is a very good question, and uh, we have been considering in our recovery framework. Um, how we listen to sometimes uh, contrary narratives. Um, so we've been looking at economic well-being. We've been looking at societal well-being, including mental health, and how we can ensure uh, that we take action around that. And uh, one of the reasons why it was very important to have Professor Siobhan O'Neill uh, put into office as, as, the health as the mental health champion. Uh, we've been looking at health, non-COVID health, and the Minister for Health, as you know, has brought forward his cancer plan uh, in relation to that. And there are many others that he needs to uh, bring forward plans upon. And I'm sure we're all getting uh, correspondence uh, in relation to that. But importantly as well, we're looking at things from a family point of view. And I know there has been a lot of discussion around the family unit. And of course, in Northern Ireland, family is very important. 
Uh, so the voice of the family needs to be there as well, and no doubt that, that will become uh, a louder voice as we move towards some of the very significant uh, times when family would be together, such as Christmas. And uh, therefore, we do have a big job of work to do in relation to how we bring together all of those different strands, uh, because it is highly important uh, that whilst, of course, we have to deal with the COVID piece, there are so many other pieces that we need to deal with as well. I call Keeve Archibald. It's Ken Corlia, and I thank the First Minister for her statement. Um, we've seen a number of cases amongst our student population this week. Um, student representatives have been saying there's some lack of clarity around messaging and guidance that's specific to them. Do you think there's enough being done to support students, including those self-isolating, and do the regulations permit students to travel home at weekends and at the end of term? Gourmet. Well, if I can start from the latter end of that question first, yes, at present students can uh, go home at the weekend and at the end of term. It's something that we will continuously uh, look at. Uh, it's back to the issue about making sure that families are able to come together. We know uniquely that young people go home at the weekend for various reasons, maybe a job, uh, maybe to, to just see their family. Um, so we would ask them to exercise caution. And of course, if they have any symptoms, uh, they should self-isolate and seek, seek a test. Uh, we are working with the universities. We're having, uh, the officials are having a meeting today with the universities. I think that is important. Um, I think some of the scenes from some of the other universities have been quite distressing on, on the mainland, I have to say. Um, and uh, I was reading this morning uh, around uh, someone who is uh, vegan, and she was being offered Mars bars uh, in support. So there's a lot of support that needs to be put into that. Um, we are in touch with Queen's University about, obviously, those who uh, have been diagnosed as COVID positive and those isolating as well to make sure that the appropriate support is in place. So it's an ongoing issue. It's a developing issue, unfortunately, uh, and it's something that we will continue to work with the universities on. Call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for her statement this morning. Um, our, our economy is not in recovery. It is hanging on um, uh, in life support at the moment. So while this um, announcement today is necessary, it's not welcome um, and for obvious reasons. But what further restrictions are being uh, considered by the executive if this intervention doesn't work? I thank the member for her question. Indeed, we are considering a menu of interventions, um, and I think it's important that we do. But I think the positive thing to say to the member today is, as we understand it from our chief scientific advisor, those household restrictions uh, that we put in uh, in Ballymena had uh, an impact of reversing the trend in Ballymena in that particular area. Uh, in Belfast, it certainly slowed the transmission of the virus, those household restrictions. So it is important that we continue to monitor the restrictions that we put in to see what impact they're having um, before we bring forward other um, restrictions. Because I, I mean, we're very conscious of the fact that the act under which this is all happening uh, and upon which we are receiving quite a lot of correspondence recently uh, says that we need to be proportionate and it needs to be necessary. And that's something that we always keep to the forefront of our mind because we do not want to be bringing forward restrictions on hospitality. We are only doing so because we believe it's necessary, but we do believe it is proportionate at this time. I call Alan Chambers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, First Minister, certainly welcome your clear message this morning uh, to the public, especially to that small minority of people who seem to think that this is some sort of a hoax to, to rob them of their, their civil uh, liberties. Um, earlier, uh, First Minister, my colleague uh, Doug Beatty asked the question if the executive had invited the Justice Minister to chair the, uh, the new enforcement body, uh, and you referred him to perhaps ask that question directly to the uh, Justice Minister. But could I uh, respectfully uh, ask you, First Minister, if at any point uh, you yourself had asked uh, the Justice Minister to chair this body? <clears throat> well, can I say to the member, thank the member for his question. It is, um, I don't want to get into the details of executive meetings. I think that would be invidious and wrong to do that. 
Um, I think it's common cause. Uh, the Justice Minister herself has made comments in relation to the enforcement group. Um, and, and I think it is my understanding uh, that the reason why she felt she didn't want to uh, chair that group was because the remit went wider uh, than, than the justice portfolio. Look, I think it's incredibly important that the executive, all of the five parties in the executive, work together at this critical time, Mr. Speaker. Uh, whilst we all may have different views on different things, it's important that we listen to the data. And I've tried to outline the data today uh, for the House as to why we're taking these decisions. I've tried to explain the rationale behind the 11 o'clock curfew as opposed to another time. Uh, and I hope members will appreciate that this is not something that we just arrive at very quickly. We take some considerable time uh, to deal with these issues. Uh, and we will continue to work together. And I think that's a critical point to try and do what is right for all of the citizens in Northern Ireland. Thank you. I call Dolores Kelly. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for uh, the statement. Um, as a member of the Policing Board, uh, Minister, you will be aware, uh, without the member, I have to say, you're a former member. Obviously, uh, policing and enforcement uh, is a huge problem. You're essentially applying uh, a policing enforcement to a health crisis. But obviously, enforcement is also the responsibility of other agencies. And I just wonder what discussions you've had with Solis, for example, and indeed in picking up Mr. Chambers' point. It's my understanding that the junior ministers would have a very clear remit in terms of ensuring that there's that dialogue and early engagement with the police and, and others in relation to how restrictions might well then be enforced. <clears throat> Thank the member for her question. And indeed, the junior ministers do take on that role, not just engaging. Uh, with the police, but also with Solus. They have been very much a part of uh, the conversations uh, and indeed wider in terms of other um, agencies as well that may have a role in enforcement. Uh, look, I mean, I think I couldn't be clearer, Mr. Speaker. We don't want to have to enforce these rules. We would much prefer if people complied with them and worked with us. But there needs to be, dare I say, at that backstop uh, to deal with these issues. And uh, the police have been very good in working with the executive office and, and if there's an issue, they come to us, they talk to us, uh, and we try and sort the issue out. Uh, as, as Mr Beattie said earlier on, none of this is perfect. We're trying to deal with an emerging situation, but I think when you look at the numbers of people who are testing positive for COVID at the moment, it is an appropriate and necessary step that we're taking. I call Patsy McLone. I'm Agus John Corlia, and just to thank the First Minister for her responses up until now. Um, on the question, the specific question of enforcement, it has come to my attention, particularly over the weekend, uh, that police are saying it, it, there's a grey area, certainly, around whether they are the lead primary agency on enforcement. Local government, senior officials at local government, are saying the precise, exact same thing to me, and they are saying that they are waiting for clarification from the executive around that. So perhaps the, the first minister could give us some. Uh, insight into that and where we are and when that situation is likely to be clarified. It, it's a wider issue, I should say, uh, Mr. Uh, Kieran Corlea, around the messaging and clarity of message that is emanating from these COVID regulations. Thank you. Yes, and I hope, and I thank the member for his question. I hope uh, that coming here today and setting out the rationale behind this decision today to close hospitality premises at 11 o'clock explains what we're trying to do in that respect. I hope it also gives clarity to the Police Service of Northern Ireland. The fact that all of the hospitality industry is closed by 11 o'clock makes it easier for them to enforce that. There's no exceptions to that. There's no late licences. Um, and therefore, they will know very well that none of these hospitality uh, should be open by after 11 o'clock. So that should help in relation to the enforcement piece. I think um, when we had the situation of the differential between wet bars and those bars that serve food, that was a difficult uh, thing to enforce, and I, I accept that. And I know that there were some very good uh, businesses who were being very faithful and keeping their doors closed as wet bar only. But there were some who were not, and they were gaming the regulations. Uh, and we were aware of that, and I think it is important that the whole of the sector is now open, but we've now put the whole of the sector into a curfew at 11 o'clock, and hopefully that will give some clarity. It will not be welcomed by the industry. I recognise that, but we're doing it to try and make sure uh, that we try and stop the spread of coronavirus and to break the transmission levels as well. I call Rachel Woods. 
I thank the First Minister and the Junior Minister for coming to the House today. Uh, firstly, could the First Minister confirm an important detail in relation to an earlier question that last orders will have to be before 10.30pm, given that she stated customers should be off the premises by 11 to facilitate drinking uptime? And secondly, First Minister, has there been any assessment done by the Executive or by our Ministerial colleague in Economy of what potential reduced hours for staff could mean for redundancies? Well, I would say to the member that uh, hotels, bars will stop serving alcohol at 10.30. So that will be the time when alcohol, uh, last orders will be at 10.30. And just to be clear about that, and then people will be off the premises by 11 o'clock. So that is um, what the restrictions uh, will say. In terms of the assessment around um, redundancies and what have you, I think the fact that we were very clear uh, that it was important that there was a second sitting uh, in restaurants and pubs that sell food. Uh, that's in an effort to try and make sure that those are viable, uh, because I think without that, there would have been a challenge uh, to some of those uh, restaurants. Um, and as I say, this will not be welcome, but I think it is better uh, than closing at 10 o'clock and having some of the associated difficulties with that. I call Jim Allister. <clears throat> of this statement, maybe the Minister would explain, but could I ask, a, has, has what has been announced this morning yet been reduced to regulations? Are the regulations now published to deal with this? And do those regulations also extend to conduct within the public houses, namely social distancing between different households? And if they do, who is going to enforce that? Is that burden on the publican or is it on someone else? And if people then retire from the pub to a local house, how is enforcement to be undertaken? First question, the, um, I, I do apologise if a draft statement was put out. The statement that I delivered is the statement, uh, just to be clear. Uh, in terms of the uh, enforcement piece, the regulations uh, will be laid uh, tomorrow. Uh, they will come into force tomorrow evening uh, at 12 uh, p.m. So tomorrow is the last day, if you like, of, of the old regime. Uh, they will come into force on Thursday. In terms of individuals in public uh, houses, uh, the responsibility uh, lies on the individuals. Um, I'm not making um, any apology for the fact that it will be difficult to enforce that. I accept that. But we're trying to say to people, uh, if you want to work with us and break the transmission of the virus, the best way to do this is to limit your social contact uh, with uh, other individuals from different houses inside, uh, and that's why we're having this limit in place. You can meet others outside uh, in the open air, which is well ventilated, and socially distancing. There's no science to this, Mr Allister, and I know uh, that you will want to interrogate the regulations, and that's absolutely the right thing for this House to do. Uh, but I would ask him to bear with us in terms of the enforcement of these regulations, because what we're trying to do uh, is something that we've never done before, but we're trying to stop the transmission of the virus, and we're asking people to work with us in that respect. Thank you. I call Jerry Carl. Um, sick pay is obviously paltry for many hospitality workers, and it's likely many will be forced to choose between making decisions that may not be the best for their health and the wider health of our community because they are financially forced to do so. I want to ask the First Minister what uh, extra provision does she or the Executive have to develop a COVID sick pay scheme for low pay workers in hospitality? Well, I hear the uh, member's question and I am sure the Economy Minister will be looking very carefully at the industry to see if there are any interventions that are needed uh, to help those who are, I accept what he says, in relation to low paid jobs, sometimes on zero hour contracts. Uh, there is a need to be aware of all of that, and I'm sure the Economy Minister will bring forward any proposals, or indeed the DFC Minister, in terms of support, if that is deemed necessary, Mr Speaker. And that concludes questions on this uh, statement, and I'd like to thank the Minister and all those members who have contributed to this discussion this morning uh, on a very important issue. Could I ask members to point of order, Mr Beattie?